Hello, and welcome to another episode of Django Chat, a weekly podcast on the Django web framework. My name is Will Vincent. I'm joined as ever by Carlton Gibson. Hello, Carlton. Hello, Will. And this week, we are going to talk about Django REST framework and specifically architecture, different approaches to putting it all together, since this is a question I get all the time, you probably do as well. And this will only be our second episode on Django REST framework, so it's worth more discussion. Yeah, what did we talk about in the first one? We talked like the basics. I think like, it was the basics. The RF yeah, and, yeah, okay. and also that was like so if looking, that was about a year ago, anyway. So um, we could refresh it's it. All changed since then. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's happened in a year? Uh, so broadly speaking, so let's just so just to tee it up. So how do you structure Django REST framework? And this, I mean, because I see teaching beginners, there's a big leap in understanding what's the difference, how does HTTP work. So broadly speaking, so I'll I'll talk until I tap out because you're the you're the expert here. But I would say there's two main ways you can structure Django REST framework. You can basically have, so you have a front end and a back end, and you can put that all within Django, do a monolith approach, or you can separate it out into a single page architecture where you have your back end running normally on Heroku or wherever, and then your front end is somewhere else. But before we get into it, um, let's just tee up Django versus Django REST framework, just for people out there. Because again, how would you describe what's what's the difference between the two? If someone comes to you and says, "How are they different?" Okay, so Django is is the web framework. So it, its fundamental role is that core web problem of turning requests into responses. Right? You can send a web request, you get a response back. You ask for an HTML page, you get the HTML page back, and it pops up in your browser. That's Django's job. And then there's a special, and it does that great. It's got everything you need for all aspects, and you can do everything that Django REST framework offers with just Django. You don't have to use Django REST Framework, but if you're going to build what we call an API, and that normally these days it means you're serving JSON, which is JavaScript object notation, which is for a machine to consume. So it's like a mobile app is going to consume data from your website. It's going to, it's not going to consume HTML. It's going to consume like a schematic JSON document and then turn that into something that it will present on the screen for you. They call those APIs and RESTful APIs. Well, we can talk about exactly what RESTful is meant to be. But Django REST Framework makes those kind of endpoints easier. So it it, it handles um, rendering to JSON, for instance, setting the right content types. Um, I don't know content negotiation. So you might want you might be able to send out JSON. You might also be able to send out XML. You might also be able to send out HTML. You might also be able to send out I don't know YAML or who knows what. But it 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 has parsers, which take incoming data that could be in JSON format or um, multi-part form, multi -part form post, like an HTML form, or any other format, XML data you might send across to your web server. It will pass that data. It has it does content negotiation about which which types of request you want, to, uh, which type of response you want to accept, and it will render that back for you. So that's the kind of core bit that J Django doesn't have that out of the box. Right. And I think that even baser way to say that is, because I think sometimes people confuse URLs with endpoints, is at the end of the day, we're dealing with the web. So it's it's sort of the same thing. It's an endpoint if it's serving up uh, JSON or, or data, and it's a web page if it's serving up HTML, CSS, everything that you yeah. see. So one one of the original things in the, this idea of REST, um, being RESTful, was that at resources, that the R was for resources, resources were meant to be addressable, uh, like, and they had a specific URL, which was their address, and you were able to say this address, right. and then you do um, use the HTML verbs to, to, to get, to retrieve the representation of the, of the object, um, Post to create a new one, put to update it, delete to get rid of it. These were so the 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 idea would rest the the, the core ideas would rest with the it's an addressable resource that you can use these verbs on, more or less. Yeah, I mean, and I think part of it is that if you're dealing with a normal website, you don't have to really you have to know, you don't have to know about HTTP at all really or the verbs. Um, but it is a little confusing because the verbs are in the header. So if you go to look at a page, an API endpoint. You can't necessarily just see what the verbs are on it. I mean, you can if you, you know, use Postman or if you use, um, you know, Django REST framework comes with a web visualization tool, but sometimes it's a little bit harder to see what all is happening there. Yeah, and in the standard browser, you only really use GET requests and then POST requests when you submit a form or something like that. So they only use two of the two of the verbs, um, and it's only in a kind of API environment that you usually use PUT or DELETE. 
as well and then there's head which just gets the sort of um metadata for the for the for the endpoint and right. other things options yeah. and stuff so if you have a so if you have a let's say a, a to-do list um in django and you want to turn it into an api broadly speaking you install django rest framework you need to create a serializer which will transform it into json and you need to point to the url you want it at that's basically yeah. it in terms of yeah, so so a serializer is like a form, right? It validates incoming data and it um, it takes your whatever you want to send back and it serializes it, it deserializes the incoming data, turns it into an ob Python object representation so that you Python can do stuff with it, and then on the way out, it will serialize it back to whichever format your your renderer uses, so JSON normally, right? Probably JSON, and these then you days, wrap, but it doesn't yeah, have to. Yeah, be. I mean, J it doesn't have to be, but JSON's the the sort of default. Yeah. And then you have a you have a view. So REST framework has some great views. It has so instead of the base generic view class that Python um, that Django gives you, which is just view and then detail view and list view, it has API view. Yeah. And then it'll have um, there's a whole list API a, list, a list view, API generic. view, a retrieve API yeah. view, a delete API view, a create update retrieve API, API view. All these generic classes class based views, which they're really fantastic. I, I the other. A few weeks ago, I was um, cracking open a new project. Uh, you know, really excited. Blank slate, uh, cracked open REST framework generics, which is the the, the module where all of these um, generic API views live. And I was just like, wow, I love this. It's just so nice. It's so it's, it's very got everything you want. It yeah. it makes it makes crafting APIs just just uh, a delight. And so I was I just had a little geek moment. Yeah. Well, and um, we're going to talk a little bit in the abstract about code. If you want to see real examples. I have a whole book on it, Django for APIs. And also, if you're struggling with the uh, DRF tutorial, I also will link to, I have a beginner's guide to the tutorial where I hold your hand and you build the exact same amount of code, but it's very beginner friendly. It doesn't assume any sort of knowledge. So those are two resources if you're hearing what we're saying, but kind of want to do it yourself. Um, so the structure though, let's talk about the structure. I mean, do you agree with this saying broadly, there's sort of two options. You can put the the back end, the front end, within Django itself, you basically you put it in the, the static files, we can talk about that, or this SPA single page app where they live on different domains. Yeah. There's new, you know, we, we'll dive into those, but I mean, I think the standard thing, if someone's talking about a single page app or they're talking about APIs and front ends, they're talking about something that's living, you know, the back end is living at app.example.com and it's serving up stuff to or excuse me, it's living at api api.example.com and it's serving stuff up to a dedicated front end, exactly. which is at yeah. you know app.example.com. And then you you know, you deal with uh chorus headers, but you're doing cross origin requests back and forth. Yeah, I mean that's that's common. So the um, I think that's most common. What would I say? Yeah, I mean, and these it, there seems to be this massive um I think because JavaScript well, front end development has become become so specialized and so difficult yeah. that there's this tendency to think, oh, it's we the back end is just an API. Now there's there's a, there's another way of looking at it. The way I it doesn't matter whether you serve it at two different domains or not. You know, you can serve it at API and app or whatever. You, but you can you can have your single page served at a single URL from your Django application and the API served from the you know other URLs on that same. It doesn't have to be different domains. It's just you know that's a pattern that some people that, that, that's popular but the way i like to think of it is are you generating doing single page apps where you're literally it's you know you basically load a single html document which is almost empty mm -hmm. and it just loads in the javascript which then builds the application by fetching from the api so that's a single page application model where you know and you never leave that one url i mean it might get updated but you the, you never refresh the page right and that's the tricky thing because with like react router and stuff it you know, it makes it look like the URL changes, but it actually doesn't. Well, the, the URL changes, but the, the you never refresh the page. That's the point. You yeah, never re, right. You never do a yeah. whole page page load, right? Because they they tie into the browser history, so you can click the back button, and that works. And right, maybe that's you know, a separate you can, discussion. You can, book, <laughs> you can bookmark those URLs and go back and to SEO. Them. You know, if it's built, yeah, yeah if it's built well, if, yeah, that, that's a trick. It's sometimes tricky to do that and then and then contrary to the so the, the distinction that i i make isn't so much are you serving it on different domains and these uh, subdomains and that is between are you doing that kind of single page application or are you serving html pages that are server rendered by django say and then sprinkling javascript on top of that 
which then enhances. And a lot of times that JavaScript will, will you know, so say you've got a form and you, that form is rendered as a static HTML form and it's fully functional as a static static HTML form. And if you click submit, it would do a page refresh. But then you load some JavaScript on top of that, which takes over that submit event and will submit it to the API directly without doing a page refresh. So if you look at, a, I don't know, I won't pick a particular example because no doubt it would be false, but you, a lot of sites that, my, that I think have done very well, they, they will be functional even if the JavaScript doesn't load. Yeah, it's a best practice because JavaScript doesn't always load. So for various and reasons. It's a, bit more work. it's a bit more work to do it that way. Um, yeah, because you're building for both use cases basically. But you can also be, for me, you can, you can get remarkably far building a static HTML site and sprinkling JavaScript on mm-hmm. it much further in, as a single developer or as a small team than needing the full expertise of the heavy um, JavaScript right. framework. And that's how it used to be when, it was, when jQuery ruled the land. It was, you know, you would sprinkle in the JavaScript and jQuery was like the library that you would use to do that. But it was very much, yeah. you sprinkle it in as opposed to, nope, we're going to toss it all over to dedicated front end yeah. land, and it, it was yeah, and but what it, it, was, it was a nice evolution as well because you there was um, what was it this thing called Backbone that was mm, built on mm-hmm. top of um, JavaScript and the, the, um, no, sorry jQuery it was built on top of jQuery and it was great because it enabled you to maintain state of these views that were, you know they were complicated yeah state and becomes it, the it problem maybe you sort of maintain it and then there was this nice slippery slope. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, React came along with the virtual DOM and all of that and it kind of changed the world because that was a much more performant um, Yes, performant once, way of doing once it. you're however large the initial load gets in there, then it's good. But there is a, little bit, of, yeah. a bit of a load time. So, but so the so the, that's how I draw it. Rather than saying it's a monolith where it's deployed as a single application um, versus um, two applications to different subdomains. It, for me, the distinction is, are you doing SPA or are you doing largely server-side rendered or the, at least the initial render is server-side with then JavaScript laid on top of that? Yeah, and if you're doing the the latter, which is more the traditional Django approach, so you have your static files in your static directory, you use something probably white noise in production, and yeah, there you go. I mean, you, you I'm trying to think. There's one other step you need with that, I think, but maybe I forget off the top of my head. Maybe you don't. Well, are you you um, you can cache it, right? So you can you want to cache your static assets. That maybe gets into the performance aspect we could talk about. Um, which actually, I wanted to ask you. That's a slight tangent, but since you maintain Django Compressor, um, well, I've helped. I've I don't maintain help, Django Compressor. I've helped. I've helped out in the past on Django okay. Compressor. Okay, invo- I still use Django. You're Compressor involved with this, much. which I yeah. believe, broadly speaking third-party package, it will minify your front end and do some stuff on the images, right? That's basically... Yeah. Well, no, so... Um, I mean, it won't optimize your images. Its specific, ta- its specific task is for CSS and JavaScript. So, right. It'll so minify let's assume that, yeah. that you... So let's assume you're loading your... You don't have to do it this way anymore, but it, it still works and it's great. You can... But let's say you're loading all your um, CSS at, in, in a single block at the top, and you might have three or four CSS files. Mm. And it will, what it will do is combine those into a single CSS file. And if you're using preprocessors like SAS or um, PostCSS or anything like that, you can run um, your, your CSS files through the preprocessor. Then it will combine them. Then it will minify them. And you then it, it will stick them in a, a known location so that next time it doesn't have to do all of that, all of those things. And it will do the same for your JavaScript. And you can even load, you can load your JavaScript at the bottom, which you always used to do. You used to put it right at the bottom, but you put it all together. But you want it in a single file on HTTP1. It's not so simple on HTTP2. Yeah, that's but, a separate. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all still, we're still way ahead of the curve. Just do the old stuff for now until, you know, the, the new stuff's proven yeah. exactly how. Well, so my question is, I mean, so... But you can you can now all the all the modern browsers allow you to use this defer attribute where you can um, you can stick the JavaScript at the top you can start it or async loading it is rather than defer you you can st- stick it at the top and it will load parallel to your page rather than blocking it which it used to do which is why you put it at the bottom. Yes, because your page loads from top to bottom. Um, so my I think the biggest performance thing around all this is caching and you know people not using a CDN. So I guess my question to you was. If you are are using a CDN, so Cloudflare or something in front, um, does it also make sense to use Django Compressor, or is that a little bit of overkill? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the the way I run Django Compressor, this is uh, this was going to be a DRF episode. Well, it's related because um, we're talking about front end. Okay, front end stuff. We'll cut back there in a minute. So the way I use Compressor is it's got a compress offline um, setting, but where you, um, as part of your build step, as part of your deployment step, you run the compress com- management command, and it generates all the um, compressed files, and then you can put those wherever wherever you want. And there's a manifest which it will quickly look up what the what the f- finished files were called and insert the right link element into the HTML as it's served. But what's good is you get you get a single a, 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 a com, com, um, conjoined compressed minimized um, CSS file. And you know if you're using other tools like Purge CSS, which eliminates your unne- unneeded CSS, then you you know you get a nice small package and your page loads loads quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and so to bring it back to our, our, D, our DRF discussion, part of, uh, I think part of why the, you know, the single page app structure is popular is also in part because now you do have, it's rare to have truly full stack people, uh, full stack teams. You have such a divide. It's sort of nice to have separate code bases for back end and front end. Yet, if yeah, you're solo and- or small developer, you know, two or three, you know, maybe that's overkill, right? I mean, if it's you or me building an API driven site, um, you know, I would probably start with serving it within Django, and then if I needed to, and I really needed to, I would go SPA, even though just because it's a little bit simpler. You know, hard to say. But the cultural thing I think is an interesting take on why would you choose one over the other, and you know, you don't want JavaScript engineers touching your backend, and probably vice vice no, versa they, in a they, large they, setting. Yeah, and so this is yeah, so this is this is another thing is JavaScript engineers don't want you touching the the front. <laughs> the front end stuff. They want to build their app. And they want to build it. How, how dare way. they? What, how dare they? Yeah. Well, no. That's, that's totally legit. What I like about Django Compressor is it may. I'm. 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 You know. I'm. I'm happy to go all the way to you know Photoshop if I have to. But I'm a back end fella when it comes right down to it. So what I like about say using Django Compressor is it enables me to do get to a point where if I have to hand over hand off to somebody who's a front end profession, you know, a solid front end professional. What I hand them isn't embarrassing, you know. It's like, you know, this is fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to use, you know, Webpack or Post CSS yeah, or that, whatever, you separate, know, whatever yeah. your whatever your tool they like. I'm able to do that. I'm saying, oh yeah, here's my build steps. And, you know, I just run it via this compressor tool, which you know runs. But you do have build but, yeah, steps. You, can, you are doing. Yeah, yeah, and I've got all those things, and it's like, yeah, no, it's it's fine, and they're like, okay, yeah, well, you know, and they can go off and build their thing without me feeling that I've, uh, you know, I've got to wow. hide my face. You know, I find the older I get, I truly less I care about <laughs> others' opinion of me. But it is true; it's nice to have some professional respect for someone else. I was going to say, um, if you're curious if a site is truly an SPA or not, if you go look at the uh, if you view source, if you see just a teeny bit of HTML and then just some long glom of JavaScript, that's an SPA. If you actually see HTML and elements being laid out, that's probably more of this you know JavaScript sprinkled in. But sometimes. You know, if you go and look at view source, because sometimes people will say, "Oh, can I? I want to, They want to build such and such a site, or I'm just curious if it's if you can't make any sense of it, it's an SPA. It's just a, yeah. a whole glob of hopefully encrypted but compressed JavaScript, um, or not not encrypted. What what do you do? You um, well, you minimize. Yeah, it. you minimize. minimize it. But and actually, for a while, it's... you were also you could do the thing where you was you could kind of obfuscate it, but you could also um, it wasn't people truly... ship source maps, source maps. Is the thing. So when you when it's totally compressed, all the um, variables are renamed. So like you yeah. know, I've got I've got a nice meaningful variable name, and it gets renamed to a. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, right? if you look at like Facebook like, or Google, well, it's it, it doesn't mean anything because it's all been processed. But um, the web inspectors, they're all able to interpret source maps. So if you if you I think Basecamp do this. I think they you know they some um, I think uh, David Hanmeier Hansen was calling someone out for their bad. I don't know, uh, a single page application or something. And, and someone's saying, well, but what about your JavaScript, which is all minimized and no one can make head nor tail to it <laughs> of? And he was like, yeah, good point. And they started shipping their source maps. So you can, you know, view source on that. And you can actually then get into the JavaScript and it will be pretty printed with the, the original source mm. code rather than. Oh, that's nice. I don't um, know if I've, I've used that. Minimized. I didn't realize browsers do that now. Very yeah. Cool. Well, that's, and that's a great analogy of, I mean, I've, this happens to me all the time that I'm, you know, opinionating on something or other to someone, and then that, and I sort of either I think, oh, I should do that, or they, you know, ask me, <laughs> like, oh, are you doing that here? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm not. But now that you mention it, <laughs> yeah. well, I, sh- I should. Yeah. 
Um, I do want to mention um, and hat tip to. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You asked the question. I didn't get to oh, answer. Oh, I'm sorry. It was this. Like so, sorry. I so I think that you know you are you asked something like um, what do I think people should do? And I think yeah, okay. I understand this whole drive towards the single page application, but there are you know four billion people on the planet who have devices not capable of running a full React app on, on networks that aren't able to download them quickly, and for me server-side rendering is still the way forward and that should be your first option and progressive enhancement on top of that which is harder to get right than it is to build a single paid app that's that's the goal um that's what you should be aiming for and it's just better and richer and nicer and more in tune with everything you want and when you and your app will display on an apple watch and it will display on a, a, a samsung smart television yeah. and it will display everywhere whereas your your rich javascript application you'll suddenly find that over the rubbish mobile network, the JavaScript page like, didn't load and they get a blank page. Yes. No, that's very true. I, two things I wanted to add, <laughs> or, or not even add, just digress from what you said. <laughs> uh, so the first is um, there is another option for structuring things, which I, I have to give credit to Jeff Triplett for mentioning this, which is if you're using Docker, which I often do, you can run it all within... Um, Docker. So you can have it in your Docker compose file, you can have a separate image for the web and then for the front end and run it all in one container. So you can basically do an SPA within Docker. Um, I was looking for more yeah, code example or some guides on this, and I don't think, I don't know of them. If anyone does, let us know. We'll add them to the show notes. But, you know, since Docker is just a box around everything, you can also do it within Docker and but I don't know if that's necessarily that much easier because then you're in Docker land. But I wanted to mention that. But the other thing is when we were talking about Django REST framework initially, part of why what trips people up, I think, is authentication is a lot more complicated in an API world um, because uh, basically because traditional web app uses session authentication. We have a cookie, so you user logs in, session object is created, and the ID is sent back to the user and stored in there, uh, stored as a cookie, and then that's passed back and forth on every request. So that basically one ID can be used to unlock, you know, 20, 40 attributes that are stored in the server. So the server is the source of truth. The ch problem with that, of course, is if you have multiple front ends, so you have a web app and a mobile app or two mobile apps at the same time, sessions kind of breaks down. So then you go to tokens or JWTs and, you know, this all is confusing. I have a whole DjangoCon talk on it, um, but I think that's another thing when people switch over to DRF land that they go, oh my God, because the official docs list four built-in ways to do it. Um, yeah, and then there's third-party options. And then there's third-party options. Zoloth, and there's this, that, and the other. And, yeah, and actually yeah. I've, um, I'd have love to get, um, yeah, the the author of some of, of, of the leading JWT package, um, Dave. I actually just invited him. I don't know if he listens to the podcast, but Dave, come on. Let's talk about Come it. On, it would be nice, though. Part of it, though, is the the ecosystem of JWTs is not core Django or core DRF. Um, so while they work well longer term, that would be nice. They should be rolled into Django, just as two factor auth should be rolled into Django itself at some point. So yeah, I mean, what can I say? It's a powerful um, word, <laughs> but you know. So that, I guess I just wanted to mention that in the context of what. Okay, so so okay, so here's an interesting thing with DRF: is why is it that there aren't more built-in op authentication options into DRF itself, like into the, the core DRF. We should have asked Tom when he was on. Well, no, the, the answer is because it's a question of maintenance. So um, there's, there's so much capacity to maintain Django REST framework and keep it going and keep it, you know, largely bug-free. I mean, you know, there's 100 tickets or whatever, but there's no, you know, it's it's got a regular update cadence and it, it's, you know, evolves over time and it's, you know, serious bugs are few and far between now. Um, most of the remaining tickets there are, you know, there's a bit of uh, vagueness about the contract in, you know, if you get in this really specific use case, it's not quite clear how it's going to behave with nulls and, uh, you know, full But broadly and, speaking, uh, it's... But yeah, it's it's a mature package now. But there's there what there isn't capacity to do is take every possible extension and bundle it inside Django REST framework. And as soon as that started, would start to happen, Django REST framework would become unmaintainable. And so it's much better that there's a third-party package for OAuth 
and there's a third party package for JWT and there's a third party package for you know if you need to map your um your serializer keys to camel case cuz that's what your angular js client requires then you know that's much better there's there's renderers outside of Django rest framework itself that you can use yeah no i mean it's it's but you know it's pros and cons i mean it's better in that it's not unmaintainable but you also are shifting the burden of maintenance to third party apps i mean for example jwts our friend jose padilla had the dominant one for quite a while and then his life yeah. got complicated and then there's a new one simple jwts and this is pretty core stuff um that yes uh, you know, and actually, but if it, okay, right. But here's the thing: if it is cool, then it'll, it'll end up being maintained. I would say um, because there's a demand. So there's companies using it. So there's companies that'll stump up developer time to make sure that the package works. And we should ask if you just we should ask Jose a little bit about why he sort of. I mean, I you know I know he got busy and he wasn't monetizing it directly, but he had you know the dominant JWT package for quite a while, and thank goodness. There's a simple JWT one, but you know there's a number of issues on Jose's one that um, cropped yeah. up. I mean, this, so that so, so that's attention. Yeah, yeah. End, no, but we en always end up talking about open source. But it's ultimately, you know, lots of people opening tickets and not so many people doing the work to fix them. Yeah. Well, we're gonna at DjangoCon Europe. We're gonna. I'm gonna be at the sprints. We're gonna, you know, get more people on board and maybe improve the docs a little bit around that. To, to make that easier. I I did want to add too. Um so I recently, well, two things. <laughs> a lot a lot of two things for me today. We haven't recorded in a while, so that's maybe that's why. So one is You got a backlog. Yeah, I I so I I soft launched um my learndango.com site. Um so there's some stuff on there and I'm slowly porting things over and and we'll do a whole episode on building that and things learned. But I put a blog post out um actually again with Jeff Triplett. Um on 10 most used Django packages based on just PyPI for the last 30 days. And um, we'll link to that. But it was interesting to me, and first in that, so it goes Django, obviously, Django REST framework, um, Django cores headers, which our friend Adam Johnson maintains, because you, mm -hmm. you know, if you're using an SPA, you have to set the cores headers. Yeah, you have to set cores headers, yeah. so there you are, done. Django filter, which you are involved with as well, is number four. Yeah. Uh, Django Redis is number five, which I was like, that's pretty high. Um, Django extensions, which makes sense. PyTest Django, Django storages, debug toolbar. And then actually, I wanted to ask you, Django AppConf is, was number 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's used by Django Compressor. But who else is using it? That's it. That's, so that's, I mean, it's quite high. Um, I mean, I, I, I haven't used it, it personally. I mean, I looked at it. I was like, oh, no, that but makes sense. But what it does. But it enables you to do per, sort of per application. So if you write a third-party reusable app and you want settings for your reusable app, Django AppConf is a nice little wrapper around that. So that's you. Who, somebody big must be using that, though, because it's used by Django Compressor. I don't know who else mm. has yeah, that. Maybe it's, but, I mean, maybe it's wrapped into something else. It must be. It just seems way too high on the face of it. Um, no, but it's like one of those um, infrastructure ones. Yeah, well... It's an infrastructure package. It's used by... X package and Y package oh. and Z package, and they sum up to a lot of downloads. Hmm. Yeah, have to unravel that. Uh, I, since I'm in a, a publishing mood, I also published my super opinionated essential third party packages, which was 18, 19, it was 17. And then people, of course, the floodgates opened with advice from people. And I think I added one or two, but um, my personal, highly biased takes on things I build everything with that, um, regardless of application. So anyways, there, no, there's some really plugs useful. in there. I, it's really useful. I remember a post, it must, when I was starting out with Django, it must have been on like, I don't know, Jacob Kaplan's Moss's blog or something like that. They, some of the early people in Django. And I was like, you know, you're getting into Django and there was this post about, you know, these five top packages. And it's oh, like, oh, wow, I these didn't, were awesome. I, oh, I didn't know that. Well, um, I, but this was a long time ago. But, you know, some, like I think Django Debug Toolbar was on there or something like that. And I'm still using that today. So. Yeah, well, and on the on the Django forum, um, there's a whole discussion on top five third-party packages. And, you know, everyone, of course, is like, well, here's five, but then here's another 10. So that kind of brought about, because really five's not enough. Um, so that brought about decision for... Yeah, you should go and make your choose, right? You, you, yeah, and I you mean... You only allow five people at your party. Who's it going to be? <laughs> And at the same time, I mean, I still have a awesome Django repo with where you know it's sort of like layers of curation where there's way more packages, but all ones that I think are you know 
seem valid to use in my opinion, um, but maybe I don't use all of them myself. So they're sort of like top five essential. And then, um, yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's helpful. I always like to hear from people I respect in the Django community what they're mentioning. I mean, you know, even um, just, just last week, uh, you mentioned Django Sesame package by uh, Imerick on you know, Magic URL opening that I didn't know about that's been around for, for forever and is perfect for something I need to do. So there's always more to always more to learn. Yeah, so you just mentioned Django Redis there. And um, yes. about five minutes before that, you mentioned the importance of caching. And of course, that's where Django Redis comes in because everyone's using it for their um, Django cache backend, right? Yeah, I, and, but I think it, you know, caching, I mean, how much time do we have? Are we going way over? Eh, 30 well, minutes. We got a couple minutes. minutes. You know, you, so there's two types, or I, I think of it, and you can dispel this, but there's, when I think of caching, so one is just, uh, you know, you use, a, you use a CDN. So you throw Cloudflare in front to serve up your site if it's basically a static site. So my LearnDjango.com site is essentially a static yep. site. So I have Heroku, I mean, I have uh, Django hosted on Heroku and then I port Cloudflare in front of that and it basically loads, you know, instantaneously. The The Redis stuff is when you're doing caching, you know, on your back end, <laughs> on your database basically, yep. um, which is a more real world use case. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I mean, there is a whole discussion of, you know, Redis versus memcache. So I think we've talked about, yeah, we talked about the caching one where basically Redis is a little bit simpler these days and seems to have the mind share, though memcache works fine as well. But Redis... I, I haven't seen a performance... Um, I saw one, but it's, it, it seemed pretty... Off, but they've got to be basically the same now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, great to, it was great, though, to see that Django Redis was that high because I always kind of wonder, and again, Django doesn't, really track anything so what you know what's the mix out there in the wild like how much is students or beginners just tossing stuff up how much is big production companies somewhere in the middle um it was i was not i was glad to see you know pytest be up there django redis be up there because i mean those make sense in large applications but i don't know if i'm you know beginner intermediate people wouldn't use those um so i don't know be nice to know what the full ecosystem looks like yeah i what the thing i see these numbers come up and one thing that i always want to know is how much of it is ci you know how yeah well that's true pi pi because as soon as you've got yeah. as soon as you've got people downloading off pi pi for ci it's like that boosts the numbers right right and i mean if if someone was inclined you can totally game pi pi and, and there's actually um jeff jeff was going to talk to us, Ernest um at python because there's some sort of another level of steps to see like the real downloads versus just the public ones or there's some other filter you can add to get a little more accurate but yeah hard to say i mean who knows but ballpark probably accurate so all right what else i think that's that's it hopefully that helps people we're very open to questions i think there's probably a lot more episodes we can do on django and apis and drf um so do let us know as ever on at chat django on twitter you could also nobody's done this actually but if you want to send a voicemail and we could put on air uh, Django chat podcast at gmail.com. You can send us a voice memo. And um, f if it's a good question, we'll play it and respond to it. Anything else, Carlton? Fantastic. No, no, no. I just, I, I, I it wasn't the episode I thought it was going to be. We've talked about front end apps and single pages and all yeah, that. Yeah, well, we had, we, couple of short, That's okay. we had a couple of short ones. So I feel, I, mean, I feel like I need to, you know, pad this out a little bit. No, that's fine. Good. All right. Join us next time, folks. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.